books are never ever boring. Nowhere's better for exploring than the pages of a book. Don't believe me? Take a look. Read a word, a line, it all. Because, dear reader, big or small, a book can take you anywhere. You need not even leave your chair or bed or room or home or car. The story comes to where you are. All you need do is look inside. That's where all its secrets hide. Nowhere's better for exploring. Books are never, ever boring. Hello everyone, I'm SF Said and I write books. Some of you might have come across one of my books, perhaps. You have read the Varjak Paw stories, stories about a cat who does martial arts. He dreams of becoming a great warrior and learns a secret martial art in his dreams. Or maybe you have read Phoenix, a story about a human boy and an alien girl who have to save the galaxy together. But what I want to talk to you about today are some stories that I didn't write, some of my own favourite books. Because the truth is, every writer is a reader. We are all readers, we are all people who love stories, who love them so much, we ended up sitting down and writing some of our own ourselves. So I'm going to tell you about some of my favourite stories. Uh, this is the first, The Cat in the Hat by Dr Seuss. This is my first memory of anything ever in the world, my first memory of being alive. I was about three years old, my uncle read me the story of The Cat in the Hat. The cat comes and visits these children on a rainy day, he smashes their house up, he causes chaos. I loved it. I thought, that cat is brilliant. I want him to come to my house and smash everything up. And I think I knew at that moment I was always going to love books and stories uh, because it seemed like anything was possible in a story. Anything you could imagine was allowed. And I loved sharing this story with my uncle. It was a kind of play that we shared together because I think he secretly wanted the cat to come to our house and smash it up too. Another book that had a huge impact on my life, a life-changing book, I would say, Watership Down by Richard Adams. My mum shared this book with me. She came to me when I was about eight years old. She said, I've just read this. I think it's the best book ever. You must read it. I had a look at it. It was a 500 page long book. It's a big old book, Watership Down. But I thought, OK, I'll give it a go. I open it up. I start to read. And from that very first page, I could not stop. The adventures of these rabbits trying to survive were so thrilling. Page turning. I really could not stop reading. I thought, how are they going to do this? How are they going to live? There were fights. There were chases. There were close shaves. I couldn't stop reading that book. And when I reached the end of it, I had to say to my mum, thank you. Thank you for sharing that book with me. That was incredible. And I remember as I read Watership Down, thinking to myself, one day, one day I would like to try and write something that is even half as good as this. I think that would be a really good thing to do with my life. And I believe my life changed forever at that moment, because really, ever since then, that is what I have always wanted to do. This book came to me at university. I was about 21 years old at this point, and a friend shared this book with me. It had been her favourite book as a child. I'd not read it as a child, but we read it together Incredible. The best book I have ever read about magic. It's about wizards and dragons. I say this as someone who loves Harry Potter. This is the one. If you like magic, read A Wizard of Earthsea by Ursula Le Guin. And I remember thinking to myself, this is exactly the kind of book I want to write. A book that you could read at any age. You could read this at eight and see an exciting adventure story about wizards and dragons, but you could read it at 21 and see that it had other levels too. There were other things going on in here, very profound things, things that would make you think, big questions, big ideas, as well as things that would make you laugh and possibly make you cry. It had everything. The whole range of human emotion and experience was in this book. So that's a very, very big one for me. And I remember after I finished writing that, I was clear this was what I wanted to do. It was not easy. I had many, many rejections before I got my first book published. I had 90 rejections, in fact. But the stories I loved meant so much to me that I could not give up. I had to keep going. I had to do everything I could to write the best books I possibly could, to try and make them as good as the ones I loved myself. That was always my ambition. And as I was writing, as I was working, as I was getting rejected by 90 people, uh, other favourite books began to appear. Other writers uh, emerged. Philip Pullman, The Subtle Knife, 
Uh, again, a friend gave me this book. Uh, it was a revelation. This is a story about parallel worlds that uses some of the most interesting ideas from science, from quantum physics. Um, Mallory Blackman's Noughts and Crosses books. These are some of my favourite books. She is an amazing author. If you've not read those, uh, there was very good TV adaptation of both of these stories recently. I think the books that are being published now that we call children's books, these are some of the greatest books of all time. I would certainly put Noughts and Crosses and Philip Pullman's His Dark Materials in that category. So these books inspired me. Uh, they made me think this is what is possible in a book. What I had thought, aged three, reading The Cat in the Hat, turned out to be true. You really can do anything in a book. Anything is allowed. Anything you can imagine. The sky is the limit. So I kept going. I persevered. Eventually, finally, uh, I managed to get Varjak Paul published. And I've been lucky enough uh, to see people reading it, sharing it in classrooms, in libraries, in homes. I hear from people on Twitter extraordinarily moving messages I get sometimes from people who've been sharing my books together. So thank you to anybody who has been doing that. Um, but the thing I just want to leave you with for National Reading Together Day um, the joy of sharing stories, the joy of finding favourite stories, whatever your favourite is, why not share it with somebody? And if you haven't yet found your own favourite story, I think you should keep going, keep reading, because it's out there. I really do believe there is a book for everybody out there. Whatever you like, whatever you're interested in, there is a book for you, and it could well be the one that you read next. is a gift. A book is a door. A book is a whisper. A book is a roar. A book is a respite. A book is a trip. A book is a rocket. A book is a ship. A book is a path. A book is a hook. A book is a world. A book is a book. Hello everybody, thank you so much for joining me. My name is Andy Stanton. I hope you're all really good and not going too crazy in 2020, the craziest year anyone's ever seen. Um, so as some of you might know, I write children's books. I write the Mr Gum series and I also write loads of other kids books as well, including the Paninis of Pompeii and Natboff, One Million Years of Stupidity. And I write some picture books as well, including Danny McGee, Drinks the Sea, Going to the Volcano, and here comes the poo bus, but we don't call, talk about that one because it's horrible. Um, so I've always loved reading. I love it so much. Reading is one of the best things you can do in life. And hopefully um, some of you guys love reading so much that you'd also like to write your own books. So I thought I'd give you a few tips and we could uh, play a couple of games with language and think about, think about how you hook readers into a story. I think a really great story is when you open the book and within a few pages, maybe even the first page, you're suddenly going, oh, I need to know what happens to these characters. I, I, I need to know more. So you instantly love the character. You love the predicament that the um, author is putting the characters in, or the, at least the world that they're, uh, they're building up for the reader. So there's lots of great tricks or techniques you can use as an author to help write stories that really hook your readers in. I'm going to talk about a couple of my favourite techniques today because they're really fun to do when you're writing stories. And one, one of the, uh, the best ways to in, uh, invent characters that your readers cannot get enough of is to name those characters correctly. What do I mean by correctly? Well, they want to be names that hook the reader's ear. That You hear those names and you, need, you want to know more about them. Or you, you, it, uh, the names give you an idea of the characters sometimes. As, a, as an author, you've got, uh, you've, you're, you're really lucky because you, can, you have complete control of what a character's called. So what you can get to do is give little clues about the character by using the right name. Uh, so if a character's evil you can give a little hint in their name that maybe they're not a very likeable character. If a character's really nice and friendly, again, you can give, uh, give 
uh, a hint. So let, let, me, uh, let me explain a bit more. For example, I called my villain Mr. Gum, and that name just sort of popped into my head. And Mr. Gum, what does it make you think of when you think about gum? Is it a nice word? For me, it's not a very nice word. It conjures up mainly two things. It conjures up uh, maybe some chewing gum it's on the bottom of your sort of uh, on the bottom of your shoe, stuck underneath the desk. So it may, maybe makes you think he's quite a grubby character. Yeah, bit of old gum. Or it also conjures up gums in your mouth. The gums in your mouth, which, let's face it, aren't the nicest part of the body, are they? Oh, the gums. So I came up with the name Mr. Gum because it was a sort of hint that the character was a bit grubby, a bit unpleasant. And it just felt right for the character. That's the most important thing. Does it feel right? When I come up with a character name, I, uh, sorry, when I come up with a character, usually, nine times out of ten, the name pops into my head at the same time which is kind of incredible. Uh, and then you kind of know you're onto the right character. Uh, and if I have to think too hard about the character's name, I usually, it usually means I don't really know who the character is. Let me give you a couple of other examples of brilliant names. I think J.K. Rowling is fantastic at naming characters. Uh, she's brilliant. What about Albus Dumbledore? That's a brilliant name, isn't it? Albus Dumbledore is the headmaster of Hogwarts, where Harry goes. And uh, let, let's think about that. So you've got the first name, Albus. It sounds very impressive, doesn't it? Albus. That tells you that you're dealing with somebody who's very upright and has authority and is important because it just sounds that way. Albus. Albus. Hello, my name is Albus. So then you've got Albus. Then you've got the surname. Dumbledore. So you've got Albus. So that sort of tells you something without saying it at all. It tells you that here's something, uh, someone who's very important, Albus, but he's going to be your friend, Dumbledore. And in fact, some of you might know this already, but Dumbledore is actually an old English word for bumblebee. Isn't that lovely? That's what bumblebees used to be called hundreds of years ago, Dumbledores. Um, but isn't that lovely? It, it, you, you get everything you need to know about that character in one name, Albus Dumbledore. Now, she could have called him important, <laughs> important, friendly man. But that's not a name, is it? So you have to get something that just suggests the name, uh, the character. Albus Dumbledore tells you everything you need to know about the character. It's a brilliant bit of naming. Again, when I think about Mr. Gum, sometimes kids ask me, why didn't you call him Mr. Bum? Hmm, well, that's a good question. But if I'd called the character Mr. Bum, that would have been a bit too obvious, wouldn't it? It would have been like calling Albus Dumbledore important, friendly man. <laughs> so Mr. Bum is funny for about two seconds and then you, don't, then you don't really get into it. You just think it's a silly joke. But Mr. Gum, <clears throat> excuse me, Mr. Gum suggests something unpleasant without actually sort of going bum, 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 wee, wee. Um, what about some, uh, 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 even, even the most uh, normal seeming names have been carefully thought about by authors. Uh, for example, I'll give you uh, three of the heroes of children's literature. We've got Harry Potter from the Harry Potter books, of course. Um, Tracy Beaker by Jacqueline Wilson. And Charlie Bucket from uh, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Those all sound like boring names at first, but they're actually really clever names. Harry Potter, Tracy Beaker, Charlie Bucket. What have they all got in common? They're all very, uh, they're not exciting names. They're friendly, aren't they? They've all got uh, Potter. It might be someone who does a bit of pottery or potters about. Oh, what are you doing? I'm just pottering about. Beaker. What's that? Just a glass you drink out of. It's, it's a very everyday name. It's not like calling somebody Tracy Starship. No, you call her Tracy Beaker. So Beaker just sounds like a a drinking glass or something. And then Charlie Bucket. Again, it's not like calling him Charlie Fantastic. Bucket. It's an everyday object. It's a normal item that you'd find in your house. So why have the authors of those books chosen such boring names for those characters? Well, it's a very clever technique of drawing your reader in again. It's by making the child hero in those stories 
a very, uh, by making them a very normal sort of a, giving them a very normal sort of a name, what you've done is get your readers to go, oh, look, there's this kid called Harry Potter. He's completely normal, but he's turned into a hero. That could be me. Doesn't matter if you're a boy or a girl. You just see, you see a boy called Harry Potter and you go, that could be anyone. So that could be me. I could be the hero of my story. Tracy Beaker, it's just a boring name, but that could be me. She's the, she's the heroine of these stories. Charlie Bucket, the most boring name. But he's going to be the hero of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. And meanwhile, you've got uh, characters like Augustus Gloop. Aug All the other kids have been given ridiculous and unpleasant names. So you don't really like them. Augustus Gloop. He's the big greedy kid from Germany. Um, Violet Beauregard. Can you, who would you rather be friends with? Violet Beauregard or Charlie Bucket? Charlie Bucket sounds like a, a lot more of a friendly name, doesn't he? So when you give you, so... Uh, when you're naming all your characters and giving some of them fantastic names, like uh, Albus Dumbledore, uh, or, <laughs> um, or Sirius Snape, um, or Willy Wonka, remember to give your hero a name that everybody can identify with. Charlie Bucket, Tracy Beaker, uh, Harry Potter. The heroine of my books is just called Polly. Uh, she has got another silly name, but m mostly she's just called Polly. So you just go, oh, all the other characters are crazy, but Polly, she's the one I'm going to follow. She's the one I'm going to relate to. And she's my favourite character because she, she's the, she, uh, the hero or heroine of a story often works as the kind of uh, normal, the, the kind of normal setting. They can be going through the most crazy, fantastic worlds, but we know that by following the hero or the heroine, they're the ones who are going to steer us through that world safely. So, um, if, so if you're looking for the sounds of words to make character names, so like I say, not Mr. Bum, but something that sounds nice, uh, that sounds suggestive, like Mr. Gum, you wouldn't call Sirius Snape Nasty Snake, but Sirius Snape suggests something from the sound of the made-up words that... Uh, make up his name. If I, I'm go, what I'm going to do is do give you a short uh, exercise here. I'm just going to give you about three minutes to do this. I'm going to give you three characters to name, and I just want you to try and name them. Write down, get out a piece of uh, pen and a paper. I just like you to sort of name those characters so that we've got a little bit of a, a clue as to what those characters do and whether they, you like them or not, whether we're to trust them or not. So here's three descriptions, let's see. Okay, how about naming a mad scientist who does crazy experiments? So think about that and you might want to write that down. A mad scientist who does crazy experiments and write down a, a baby who is a genius, a six month, old baby who's a genius and let's think of one more uh, character type how about a quiet girl at school uh, and she uh, she's a bit shy she's got really thick glasses and a terrible haircut and sometimes she gets picked on a bit but in her imagination she's a really cool superhero so could you come up with a name that make, makes us think of a shy girl uh, really thick glasses, keeps herself to herself, but she's got a secret life in her head where she's got an amazing imagination. Can you just put in a hint that something tells us that she's a bit extraordinary in her name somehow? I'm going to give you like three minutes to um, come up with some of those names and just use the sound of words and play with the ideas of words and see what you can come up with. So I'll give you three minutes. I'll try not to distract you. I'll put on my non-distracting eyes. You've got two minutes left to write those character names.
Okay, guys, I think you've got about less than less than one minute now. So, uh, how are you getting on with those names? I'll, sh I'll shut up. You've got half a minute left. And I'm going to call time on that. So if you came up with any great character names, um, you can hashtag, uh, use the hashtag that should be coming up on the screen sometime about now, and um, send a tweet and send us your, your best character names for those characters we just invented. And uh, yeah, use the hashtag and hopefully someone will have a look at those. Um, yeah, send us your best ones. Um, so another, another the, the second thing I want to talk to you guys today about is first lines. I love, I love a good first line. First, what should a first line in a book do? Well, to use this handily placed <laughs> Mr. Gum book again, this is my first uh, Mr. Gum book, You're a Bad Man, Mr. Gum. What are the first things you, re you know about a book when you see it? You, you, you get the cover, you get the title. Okay, that looks like fun, maybe, you think. You open it up and the, f the very first thing you, you hear uh, the very first bit of information you learn about a book is from the first line. The first line of Mr. Gum is, Mr. Gum was a fierce old man with a red beard and two bloodshot eyes that stared out at you like an octopus curled up in a bad cave. So I really like that first line because I wrote it and I'm brilliant. But I really like it because it tells you instantly this is going to be about a horrible old man. And uh, if you look at the sort of language I use... Um, a fierce old man with a red beard, two bloodshot eyes. It's very visual. It's very overdone. It's very overbaked. It's like a big cartoon. And then his bloodshot eyes stared out at you like an octopus curled up in a bad cave. So you get an idea that that book is going to be maybe very silly and like a, a sort of cartoon made out of words, which is what my books are like. Um, I thought I'd read you some other brilliant first lines from children's literature. Well, not just from children's literature. Um, here's a great line, actually. This is from a young adult book, um, adult's book, by Charlie Higson. Uh, there were 13 men around the table. By the end of the day, one of them would be dead. So that tells you stuff about the book immediately. I'll read it again. There were 13 men around the table. By the end of the day, one of them would be dead. Now, if I were reading that, my first thought would be, this probably isn't going to be a funny book, it's going to be like a thriller, which it turns out to be. It's one of the young Bond books about uh, young James Bond by Charlie Higson. So, it, uh, it, but, it, but it instantly, not only does it tell me that it might be a serious book, it instantly gets me asking questions. Why are there 13 men? That's a sinister number, by the way, isn't it? 13 men around the table. It sounds serious. It sounds like a meeting. It sounds important. By the end of the day... One of them would be dead. Why are they dead? Who are these people? What's happening here? It sounds like serious business is afoot, doesn't it? So you're instantly asking questions. Who are these people? What is this about? There's, there's intrigue there already. Uh, let's try a different sort of first line. Oh, you might know this first line. What a lot of hairy-faced men there are around nowadays. What a lot of hairy-faced men there are around nowadays. Do you know where that one's from? It's from the Twits. Uh, by Roald Dahl. If you don't know the twits by Roald Dahl, what sort of book might you think that is? What a lot of hairy-faced men there are around nowadays. Does it sound serious? To me, it instantly tells us we're in a cartoony world. A again, a bit like Mr. Gum, who has got a beard. <laughs> um, because it, cause the, the language is very playful. What a lot of hairy-faced men there are around nowadays. And you go, oh, okay, great. This is going to be a funny book. It's going to be a silly book. Uh, a successful first line gives you, just like a name of a character gives you a clue as to that character, uh, what they do, whether they're trustworthy, whether they're likeable, whether they're a goodie or a baddie, a first line of a book tells you something about the kind of book you're going to read and gets you intrigued and gets you asking questions about what's going to happen next. Let's see. Oh, this is another really... Oh, this one's given me goosebumps. This one's spooky. This one's by Charlie Higson again. 
uh, from another series of his called uh, The Enemy. Small Sam was playing in the car park behind Waitrose when the grown-ups took him. Sorry if that freaked you out, it's freaking me out. Small Sam was playing in the car park behind Waitrose when the grown-ups took him. Now, just by using, let's count the words, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Fifteen words and telling you very, very little about the world you're in. Things are being suggested. Small Sam. Small Sam doesn't sound very powerful, does he? Probably sounds like a kid. He was playing in the car park. Great, but then the sentence shifts. When the grown-ups took him. Sorry, that was one of the many devices of modern day life going, but um, probably someone to text me, to tell me some rubbish. Um, Small Sam was playing in the car park behind Waitrose when the grown-ups took him. It tells you that this is a dangerous world that you're about to enter. It's probably going to be quite exciting. There's a, already been a, some sort of weird kidnapping in the first line. But it doesn't tell you anything more, does it? Um, I won't tell you what happens in The Enemy. It's a very spooky book. But, um, but what's brilliant about Charlie Higson's first lines, and he, already, he wrote that other one about the, um, by the end of the day, one of them would be dead. He doesn't give you any clues as to why this is happening. He just tells you there's a story here. It's sinister. And the reader goes, I need to know more. I need to know more. I need to find out. So you don't tell everybody everything that happens in the first line. This is a very, oh, this is brilliant. This is a great first line. If you went too near the edge of the chalk pit, the ground would give way. <laughs> if you went too near the edge of the chalk pit, the ground would give way. That's from a very famous book from the, I think it, oh, when was it written? Oh, at least, at least 40 years ago, 30, 50 years ago, maybe. Stig of the Dump um, by Clyde, who's it by? I forget who it's by, Stig of the Dump. Um, if you went... Too near the edge of the chalk pit, the ground would give way. When I read that first line, I figure that something's going to happen later in the story. Do you as well? When I read that first line, I think, OK, the ground is going to give way at some point coming up in the story. So there's a kind of promise in the first line. I'll give you this piece of information so it's in your head. And now you're reading on to see what happens, and later in the book, of course, the hero of the story is playing too near the edge of the chalk pit, the ground gives way, he falls down into the chalk pit, and there he discovers something amazing, which leads to the rest of the story. So it's an amazing trick to say very little, but to set up the promise of something that's going to happen later in the story, because the reader goes, brilliant, brilliant. I'm go it's something, uh, I, I, I've got a story here, I need to find out how this goes wrong. W what about if he just said, there was a chalk pit near the village? Who cares, big deal. But if you went too near the edge of the chalk pit, the ground would give way. All right, I need to know what happens. I need to know, I need to know, I need to know. Um, so, so that's a very clever, quiet first line that contains a promise. My favourite of all first lines in children's literature for giving you a promise like that is from Coraline. Have you seen the movie Coraline, uh, which was based on Neil Gaiman's book? Uh, Neil, Neil Gaiman's short story, actually. It's quite a short story. It's a brilliant story. Uh, the, the story is also called Coraline, and this is the first line of it. Coraline discovered the door a little while after they moved into the house. Coraline discovered the door a little while after they moved into their house. That's another one that's giving me goosebumps, just because it's so exciting. So much information in those very simple words. You don't need to use clever words. Coraline, it's how you use them. Coraline discovered the door. If, he, if it's a door that needs to be discovered, it tells you that something pretty interesting is going to be behind that door, doesn't it? Otherwise it will be, Coraline moved into a house and there were some doors. Who cares? Coraline discovered the door. It kind of tells you that this is not a normal door. This is a door that you have to discover. You miss it on your first look round your house. Maybe you miss it on your second look round the house. Maybe it takes a month. Coraline 
discovered the door a little while after they moved into the house. She came across the door. Now, when I see something like that, I know that at some point in the story, that door is going to be opened and there's going to be something exciting behind that door that leads to the rest of the story. It's like the chalk pit in Stig of the Dump. If you played too near the edge of the chalk pit, the ground would give way. Coraline discovered the door. It sets up a brilliant promise. Let's say, for example, that that story, Coraline, was, just to make it easy, let's say it's 100 pages long. What page, if that's the first line, what page would you like that door to be opened? I'll let you think about that for a minute. Would you like it to be opened immediately on the second page? Would you like it to be opened around a third of the way through, like page 33? What about, would you like it to be opened on the last page? Have a think about where you'd like it to be opened. I'll tell you where I'd like it to be opened. I think about a third of the way through is really good because we keep the door in the reader's mind because it's been in the first sentence and then we do some other stuff and then maybe she approaches the door a bit later, but she doesn't open it this time. Maybe she gets scared. Uh, um, I, I, I like the tease. I like the tease of setting up the fact that there's this mysterious door. If it was opened on the last page, and then Coraline opened the door, and there was just some old sweets there, great. Well, no space for a story. Who cares? Coraline opened the door. Eh, it was just a normal room. Who cares? If Coraline opens the door immediately, if it says... Uh, Coraline discovered the door a little while after they'd moved into the house, then she opened it, there were some amazing adventures there. Who cares? You haven't had time to get excited about it. If you set up a promise, like the chalk pit going to give way, or uh, Coraline discovering a door, if you set up such a th thrilling promise as that, tease the reader with it a little bit. Don't let our character go through to the place where the story starts to happen for a while. Tease the reader. Don't tease them too long, but maybe about a third of the way through the story, maybe 25, 30 pages into the story, if it's 100 pages long. Let's see that initial promise. Let's see what lies behind that door. Let's see what's in the chalk pit. So the trick of a really brilliant first line. Let's see, there's at least two things to bear in mind. What kind of book this is? Is it a funny book, a silly book, a spooky book? A, uh, a serious book, a very, um, uh, uh, you know, is it a crime thriller? Is it, is it a comedy? All of those things, using the language and the tone, that's one thing to think about. What a lot of hairy men there are around nowadays. That sounds silly, um, in a good way. Coraline discovered the door. That sounds mysterious, spooky, interesting intriguing. Um, there were 13 men sitting around the table. By the end of the day, one of them would be dead. That sounds really serious. So that's one thing. A first line tells you what kind of book you might be reading. And the other thing is, it contains some sort of a promise without explaining why. It doesn't, it doesn't explain why. Imagine if, uh, this isn't what happens in Coraline, but imagine if it said, Coraline discovered the door where the witches were hidden behind a little what too much information. So by saying very little, how many questions can you make the reader ask in their head about what you've written in just a few words? We're going to do one more exercise. I'm going to run a few minutes over. But I'm going to give you five minutes to write down five very different first lines for stories. Uh, stories that, you're, that don't even exist. Just see what you can do. Um, to make a first sentence, a first line, as interesting, intriguing, and uh, to, what, what you can do to grab a reader in and want to read more, just as an experiment. And by the way, a first line can just start with one word. It can just work, or, or two words. Like, Watch out! Or um, it can start with speech. Watch out! Um, I have never liked you. <coughs> Excuse me. I have never liked you, said the ogre to Stanley, and now I'm going to eat you. You can go right into the middle of it, uh, of the story, or it can just be something much quieter, like, um, 
I always enjoyed looking out of the window onto the courtyard, but I rarely saw anything interesting out there until that Tuesday, something that draws you in. So I'm gonna give you five minutes to come up with five very different uh, first lines, trying to make some of them funny, some of them spooky, some of them in, uh, serious, some of them playful, whatever you like. Uh, it doesn't matter if you don't get all five, but I'll give you five minutes and I'm going to start that now. Go for it. And I'll try not to distract you again. I've got my non-distracting eyes. Okay. <laughs> I'll leave you alone for a few more minutes. Okay guys, how are we doing? I reckon we've got a minute. I'm gonna give you slightly less than five minutes. We've got one minute more. Like I say, it doesn't matter if you don't get five different ones, just see if you can, even if you can get one or two really intriguing lines, then you're on your way to being a writer. I love first lines. I'm going to cut you a little short. Right, you can carry on working on both of these things, um, making character names, just making, you don't even need my character descriptions, you can, <coughs> excuse me, uh, just see what sort of interesting names you can come up with for characters, which can, by the way, just coming up with an interesting character name can sometimes be the springboard to writing a story. Uh, 
if you just, you know, invent, I don't know, someone called Bobby Rockets, you go, oh gosh, I've got to write a story about Bobby Rockets now. Um, same with the first line. You might just write a first line that's so intriguing that you might want to just follow that first line and see what happens if you were to write the story beyond it. Um, there's lots and lots and lots and lots of different things you have to do as an author, as a writer. But like, as I say, hooking your reader in, getting them to care about the characters that you write and be excited by those characters or have opinions about them and hooking them in with a really, really strong first line are two uh, very basic but very powerful tools that all writers use. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed listening to me and if you haven't then I'm really sorry. What, am I, what can I do? What can I do? This is, this is life. Sometimes it's a bit disappointing but hopefully that was enjoyable and useful to you. Um, send in all your brilliant first lines and character names using the hashtag that I'm hoping they're putting up on the screen around now. Use that hashtag on Twitter and stuff like that. Have a lovely rest of the day guys and Keep reading, keep writing. Stay well, guys. Bye! This is a poem called Book Shaped Adventures. I've been lost in the snow. I have lived in a tree. I have dived in the ocean's deep. I've been stuck in a swamp, stood high on a dune, and I've climbed a mountain steep. I have swung in a jungle, I've painted a cave, I've slept in a hollowed nook. I have wandered the world, and I've walked on the moon, and all because of a book. Hello there, I'm Mary Myatt and I'm delighted to be uh, sharing some thoughts with you um, on this great event promoting reading. And I want to focus in particular on the importance of reading aloud to our classes. Um, so I'm just going to spend uh, a little bit of time developing why I think that's important and uh, why I think it's not happening as often as it might. So, um, we know from the cognitive science that our brains privilege story. It's kind of intuitive in any case that we tend to remember things more in a story, um, but it's quite useful to have you know, some evidence that supports that to say it's a good thing um, for us to be exposed to, to listen to and to read stories. Now, um, one of the tendencies is to think that Storytelling and stories um, are only part of the literacy um, lessons in primary um, or perhaps in secondary and English lessons. And what I want to make the case is that uh, stories have a place in every part of the curriculum and in every subject. Um, if um, we read more to our children, their enjoyment of reading would be far higher because they'd experience it more. Um, if we read more to children, they'd also have more background knowledge um, for when we're teaching a topic or a unit. Um, they'd have greater input into the hinterland, which is much discussed in terms of children understanding where new material might sit and the background to that. So it's got all sorts of um, helpful um, um, advantage, helpful um, insights and um, as an instrument to support children's deeper learning beyond the fact it is a good thing in, of, in and of itself. So there are some barriers to reading aloud to our children in class. One of those barriers is because it feels like a very enjoyable thing to do. So if I'm reading aloud to a class, it's generally a lovely atmosphere. And so at the back of our heads, we're thinking, well, can this really be work? Well, it is work. That's why it's helpful to have the cognitive science backing this up. Because something is enjoyable, it doesn't mean that it's not work. And so that lovely sense that we get when a lesson is going well, what Claire Seeley, um, who's um, in charge of school improvement in Guernsey, is what she calls the collective cuddle. And 
uh, you know, this is a marvellous thing. So let's let's relish it rather than thinking that it can't be proper work. Um, another reason why um, it's possible that we don't use stories as much as we might do is that um, as a sector, we tend to privilege writing above everything else. Now, writing is obviously important, but, you know, within the national curriculum, there are three elements before you get to the writing, and that's speaking and listening and reading. So it's a very important strand, um, and I'm arguing beyond the English national curriculum, it's a very important strand in children's learning that they should speak, they should listen, and they should read and be read to, um, uh, not just for the sheer pleasure of it, but in order to develop their learning. So I think we've got to overcome some of the barriers of, you know, it being enjoyable. The fact that if um, someone came into the classroom, what does it look as though the children are doing? They're not doing very much, but it's all going on internally. Um, and so to work through what those objections are so that we get to the heart of the matter, which is children having access to um, high quality stories and texts. Now, the second strand to this is that children need to be read to above their pay grade. And this is particularly important um, for children who might be slower readers. Um, the, the point is that we can process vocabulary and ideas orally, even if we can't recognise the text Im um, immediately. And this is um, exemplified by a really interesting piece of research that came out last year uh, from Sussex University, the Faster Reading Research. Um, small scale project, but with some really interesting um, results where um, some year eights, uh, 365 uh, year eights across a number of schools um, for 12 weeks were, were read aloud um, either the, the teacher to begin with and then uh, across the class as appropriate, um, demanding novels at least a year above what they would normally experience. And what they found was at the end of that 12 weeks that um, the whole cohort um, as a whole, had they'd improved their reading scores by eight and a half months. And uh, but for the poorer readers, their reading scores had improved by 16 months, 16 months, one six. So when they teased out and had conversations with um, the children about the poorer readers, about why they'd done so well, they said, well, we don't often get the chance to get into big stories um, and complicated stories. Um, but we found that we could understand um, a lot of it and that motivated us to want to carry on. So quite often the diet for some of our poorer readers is um, quite a diminished diet of um, spag and phonics and decoding, all of which are important. But if they don't get access to the bigger ideas, the bigger material, then um, we're widening those gaps. And they're also missing out on the joy and the pleasure um, of being read to and reading themselves. So, um, the case to summarise is that let's find lots of interesting texts and stories across the curriculum uh, beyond the English uh, literary canon, marvellous as it is, but to extend that into history, into science, into maths, into religious education, into every single subject. There are marvellous stories and texts that I think our children are entitled to. So just to summarise my thoughts then on the uh, curriculum uh, and in relation to the reading. Um, if we want to have our children access to the big ideas, the concepts, um, the rich vocabulary, the background, then the most efficient way is to do it through a story. And the final reason is that because we're hardwired to engage with and fall in love with stories and with the ideas within stories, they're very inclusive. So it doesn't matter where children are, it doesn't matter what their prior attainment is, the selection and the delivery of a great story is going to improve outcomes for the whole class in general. 
and for that group of youngsters in particular. So I urge us all as a sector to take this element of our provision really seriously. And by the way, we might enjoy some of it, but that's no bad thing. Hello, I'm Carl Newson. I'm a children's book writer, the author of picture books such as I Am A Tiger and The Same But Different Too, of early reader fiction such as The Hat Full Of Secrets and of educational titles such as I Am A Lion, which I'm going to read to you today. This is illustrated by Nancy Leshnikov. I am a lion, short and thin, and this is how my line begins, a stretched out dot just waiting for someone like you to make it more. To help it wander here and there, a line can take you anywhere. A zigzag mountain way up high, a rainbow curved across the sky, all wavy through the deep blue sea. What will your line be? Wild lines that roll and play are shapes made an organic way. Geometric lines make a pattern just like in the rings of Saturn. Straight lines can be horizontal, diagonal or vertical, thick or thin, short or long. With a line, you can't go wrong. Lines make shapes, some square, some round. Lines are tunnels underground. Lines can take you up in space. A line can take you any place. A dotted line could lead the way. A looping line makes a bouquet. A squiggled line could make a knot. And all this from a stretched out dot, an empty page, a pen, and you. There's nothing that a line can't do. There's nothing that a line can't be, once you have set it free. Ready, steady, whee! Hi, I'm John Doherty, and I want to celebrate Reading Together Day by reading together, I'd like to read to you an extract from one of my Stink Bomb and Ketchup Face books, the third in the series, Stink Bomb and Ketchup Face and the Evilness of Pizza. Now, before I read this, a couple of things you need to know. One is that the bad guys in the Stink Bomb and Ketchup Face books are the Badgers. And because they're so bad, they spend a lot of time in jail. So this is the Badgers in jail in chapter six planning a breakout. If only we had a spade, said Rolf the Badger, a big badger with a big badge that said Big Badger. Then we could dig our way out. Good idea, Rolf the Badger, said Harry the Badger, taking a sip of tea from a mug marked World's Best Badger. How could we get a spade? Well, suggested Stuart the Badger, the smallest of the badgers, we could go to the shop and buy one. Harry the Badger sighed. We can't go to the shop and buy a spade, he said. Oh, said Stuart the Badger. Why not? Because we're in prison, explained Harry the Badger. Oh, said Stuart the Badger. Maybe we could dig our way out. And then go to the shop and buy a spade. And how, asked Harry the Badger impatiently, are we going to dig our way out? Stuart the Badger scratched his head. Um, with a spade? Harry the Badger sighed again. Has anyone else got any stupid ideas, he said sarcastically. Oh, me, me, I've got a stupid idea, said all the other Badgers at once. And they began to tell Harry the Badger their stupid ideas. Some of them really were very stupid ideas indeed. Harry the Badger held up his paws for silence. Maybe I wasn't very clear, he said, cutting off a particularly stupid idea about a cup of coffee and a flying jellyfish. When I said, has anyone else got any stupid ideas? What I really meant was, shut up. Oh, OK, said the other badgers, and they all shut up. Now, said Harry the Badger, if we can't dig our way out, 
We're going to have to find some other way of escaping. Let's see. He looked at the floor. We can't go down without a spade. He looked at the door. We can't go forward without a key. He turned round and looked at the wall. We can't go backwards without um, a thing for smashing holes in walls. He looked up at the ceiling. It was quite a long way up, and right in the middle of it was a small, square skylight. Aha, he said meaningfully. Uh, no, said Stuart the Badger helpfully. That's not aha, it's a window. Harry the Badger sighed. Maybe I wasn't very clear, he said. When I said aha, what I really meant was, oh look, there's a skylight. Maybe we could make a tower of badgers and climb out of it. Oh, okay, said the other badgers. And they made a tower of badgers. It was a very tall, thin tower of badgers, but it didn't quite reach the skylight. Bother, said Harry the Badger. If only we had something to stand on. What about the games cupboard, said Rolf the Badger, from somewhere underneath Harry the Badger. He pointed at the small cupboard full of games that sat in the corner of the jail. We could move that and stand on it said Stuart the Badger from somewhere underneath Rolf the Badger. We mustn't move the games cupboard. Why not, said Harry the Badger. Because someone might fall down the hole, explained Stuart the Badger. The other Badgers stared so hard at Stuart the Badger that they all lost their balance and the tower collapsed, spilling Badgers all over the floor. Harry the Badger picked himself up. What hole? he demanded. Well, said Stuart the Badger, when we first got put in prison, I noticed there was a big hole in the floor. So I moved the games cupboard on top of it so that no one would fall down it. Harry the Badger took a deep breath and let it out very slowly. This hole, he said in an odd sort of voice, would it be big enough for, say, a badger to get through? Stuart the Badger nodded. Oh yes, he said cheerfully. Harry the Badger took another big breath and let it out even more slowly. Then in the same odd voice he said, And do you think the hole goes a long way down? Stuart the Badger nodded again. It looked like it went ever such a long way, he said. Harry the Badger took a third big breath and let it out more slowly still. All the way out of the prison, perhaps? Oh yes, said Stuart the Badger. Harry the Badger took a fourth big breath and forgot to let it out at all. After a while he went purple and made a funny squeaky noise and then he remembered and let it all out at once. Did it not occur to you that a big hole that goes all the way out of prison might be useful to badgers who are locked up in prison? Nope, said Stuart the Badger. Then his eyes widened. Wait a minute, he said. If the hole's big enough for a badger to get through. Yes, said Harry the Badger. And if it goes all the way out of prison... Yes, said Harry the Badger. Then a badger could go through the hole. Yes, said Harry the Badger. And get all the way out of prison. Yes, said Harry the Badger. And go to the shop and buy a spade, said Stuart the Badger. And then we could dig a hole and escape from prison. And if you want to know what happens next... You're going to have to read Stink Bomb and Ketchup Face and The Evilness of Pizza. I hope you enjoyed that. I really hope you enjoyed that because the whole point of reading together is that it's fun. And I want to talk to you just for a couple of minutes about the fun of reading together and how to get the best out of it. Now, when you're reading together as a family or as siblings or whatever, in whatever combination you're reading together from everybody, 
the most important thing to remember is there aren't any rules. Some people will get the idea that, oh, there are all kinds of rules around reading and you have to read the right kind of book and you have to read it in the right kind of way. No, it's fun. It's fun. If you're not reading a book together and you're not enjoying it, you don't have to finish it. It's like if you were playing a game and you all went, actually, this game's a bit boring. You'd stop playing and you'd play something different. In the same way, if you're reading a book together and you're not really enjoying it, you don't have to finish it. Just stop and find a book that you do enjoy and read that together. Now, if possible, find a book that all of you will enjoy. Now, mums and dads, you know that sometimes when you're doing something with your kids, if you're not enjoying it, but they're having a great time, you keep doing it because you love how they're enjoying it. And, and it's like that with books. There will be times when your kids will want to read a book and you won't be that keen, but they're really loving it. So you'll read it with them and that will be fun because they're having fun. But the best fun is when you find books that you can all read together and really, really enjoy. And the good news is there are loads and loads of them out there. I hope some of you will read some of my books like Stink Bomb and Catch Your Face because when I'm writing a book, I try and make it so that the grown-ups who are reading with the kids will enjoy it too. But there are ways of finding lots of books out there. First of all, check out everybody who's appearing on Reading Together Day. There are loads of writers here on this website and, and they've written brilliant books. And, you, and you'll probably find some new writers you've never heard of before whose books you'll love. Don't just go for the famous books. There are books that are famous for a reason, like Roald Dahl. Everybody loves Roald Dahl, or almost everybody loves Roald Dahl, because they're great books. But then some people go, oh, well, Roald Dahl, that's what you read. But there's so much else out there. You know, use your library. Go to the library and try out books. Talk to children's librarians. When you go to the library, say to the librarian, is there somebody here who deals with the children's department? I want some advice. I want to find some new writers. Talk to specialist children's booksellers. If you go into a bookshop, ask if they've got someone whose whole job is buying books for children and reading books for children and talk to them. And some of you will be lucky enough to have a teacher who lo knows loads about children's books. Some teachers don't. And if you go to your teacher and say, uh, uh, what, what should I read? And they just only know the, the, the really good, well-known books like Roald Dahl and David Williams and Enid Blyton. Fine. But if your teacher is, if you're lucky enough to have a teacher who knows loads and loads of really good children's books, then make the most of that and say, what should I read next? And most of all, have fun. My children are kind of grown up now. You know, they're, they're 17 and 19. So we don't have those lovely, snuggly times together anymore. I really miss them. I hope that all of you as families will make the most while you still have that time of snuggly times reading together. It really was one of the best parts of my day. And I'm kind of looking forward to one day being a granddad and being able to do it all over again. Anyway, thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the reading from Stink Bomb and Ketchup Face. I hope you're enjoying reading together and that this day is helping you to make the most of that and find out new ways of, of, of learning to read together and having even more fun. And I want to finish by sharing one more book with you. I don't have time to read you There's a Pig Up My Nose, but I'd like to finish by sharing the theme song with you. Here we go. Hope you enjoy it. Thanks for listening. My name's John Doherty. Bye. Wake up in the morning, bounce right out of bed But can you hear a sort of snorting coming from inside my head? Kinda sounds like oinking, what on earth could it be? Do you suppose there's a pig up my nose? With a curly tail and a snorting snout how on earth will I get it out? Is there any remedy anybody can propose? Boy, just pick up my nose. Go and see the doctor. He peers inside my throat. He checks my tongue and he takes my temperature. Then my parents write a note. 
to explain to my teacher what they think's going on, cause they all suppose they're the pig of my nose, with a curly tail and a snorting snout, how on earth will I get it out, is there any remedy anybody can propose, for this pig of my nose. Boy, this pig up my nose. Boy, this pig up my nose.